8.31st and 21, I went to bed at my family's home in Greenwood, the neighborhood. I felt the sleeping that night was rich, not just in terms of wealth, but in culture, heritage, and my family had a beautiful home. My family was driven out of our home. We were left with nothing. I was blessed to live with my grandmother in a beautiful black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma, called Greenwood. I was a young child. I didn't have any fear. I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. We were made refugees in our own country. White men with guns came and destroyed my community. We couldn't understand why. What did we do to them? We didn't understand. I remember running outside of our house past dead bodies. I still see it today in my mind, a hundred years later. My name is Viola Ford Fletcher. I'm a survivor of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Two weeks ago, I celebrated my 107th birthday. Our country may forget this history, but I cannot. I will not and other survivors do not. Our descendants do not. Greenwood should have given me the chance to make it in this country. My name is Hughes Van Ellis. I am 100 years old, and I am a survivor of the Tulsa Race Massacre. My name is Leslie Evelyn Benningfield Randall. I have survived to tell this story, I believe that I am still here to share it with you. Please give me my family and my community some justice. We were made to feel that our struggle was unworthy of justice. Like we didn't see it with our own eyes. Black Wall Street survivors and descendants have yet to obtain real justice. We are talking about a state-sanctioned, deputized white mob wreaking havoc by land and air on more than 35 blocks of Tulsa's black community, known as the Greenwood District, Black Wall Street, or in a report from the American Red Cross, Little Africa. As a result of this violence, more than 10,000 people were displaced, at least 300 killed, many left in unmarked graves, at least 1,200 homes destroyed, and an estimated 4 million in property damage in less than 24 hours. For context, calculations of all known damages are closer to $200 million currently. Frozen assets at banks and the refusal of insurance companies, many still in existence today, to process claims based on a riot clause left those who survived hopeless. Some forced to relocate, while even more found themselves impoverished and labeled refugees in their own country when they helped build. And still, some rebuilt in the face of ordinances that made that process prohibitive. They repurchased homes and restored businesses in the face of redlining. They survived. They told their stories despite threats to remain silent. 100 years later, white mobs are still pillaging communities across the country, including state capitals and most recently our nation's capital, in the name of white supremacy and making America great again. Much like the mobs that caused the devastation in Tulsa, they have yet to be held accountable for their actions. Today, we will determine how to organize at every level to ensure this never happens again and learn how to heal from the ancestral trauma we carry in our bodies 
after continually facing hundreds of years of systemic racism and oppression. By developing a pathway for the reimagination of Black Wall Street today, we will ensure that we are more triumphant than ever before. The resilience and tenacity of the survivors and descendants of the Black Wall Street massacre brought us to the threshold of justice and true repair. Now, it's time for us to walk united through that door. I have the great privilege and honor of sitting down today with the three remaining survivors from the Tulsa Race Massacre. Yeah. Mother Fletcher, how are you doing? Fine. You're fine. Uncle Red, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Doing great. I'm okay. very excited. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Mother Randall, if I can come to you, do you have some positive memories of what it was like growing up um, in Tulsa at, that, at the time before the massacre? Well, before the massacre, I was such a small child but I do remember some things, you know. We just had regular things. This wasn't too too much, really. But it was, it's enough. It was enough for us at the time. Times were good. Uh, we didn't have a lot of robbery and all that stuff like we had now. So we all enjoyed it, really. And and Mother Fletcher, I know that you were six and seven years old when everything happened. Um, but what about um, before it happened? What are your fond memories? We enjoyed living in Tulsa. It's, the people were successful with night houses and parks and churches, theaters, oh, just so many things that we enjoyed doing. And I had a lot of family members, friends, children that we played with but, in parks and went to school. Oh, I could tell, I can't mention so many things that we enjoyed at that time. And I would, yes, I was only seven years old until that happened, and then I left Tulsa with my family. And um, if you can tell me, Mother Fletcher, was there a sudden moment? Was it the day? Was it on May 31st where you all were like, we got to get out of here? Or did it take some time? Oh, what yes, yes. Well, then when we were there, happily living until one night. Well, we heard the noise of guns shooting and people running and screaming. We could smell smoke, and houses being burned, and people getting killed, really. And then someone came through the neighborhood and said, for all the black people to get out of town, if not, you'd be killing. Said, the white people are killing all the black folks. So, joining my family, in a horse and buggy wagon, well, we got out of town that night, yes. And after then, well, it was, well, I was a teenager before I came back anymore, wow. yes. Through a process called epigenetics, we've recently learned we carry the trauma of our ancestors in our physical bodies. When we exist unhealed and events arise that re-traumatize us, we can further pass all of this harm down through our lineage. Joining us is the author of the New York Times best-selling book, My Grandmother's Hands, Resma Minikim, Tulsa native and community organizer, Greg Robinson II, activist, Brittany Packnett Cunningham, and Dr. Jelani Cobb. Thank you all so much for being here. And yes, I do wanna talk about trauma. Desmond Tutu, when he visited Tulsa in 2004, said it was a powder keg. How do people begin to heal, to metabolize the trauma that's here? The fact that they're gaslit at every turn, people who look like them are helping to perpetuate the harm. What do we do? First thing I think we have to do is acknowledge that something has happened and continues to happen to our people, right? I think one of the ways that gaslighting works is that the people that are being gaslit believe it. Right. And I think for us, what we have to begin to do is start to begin to do things um, that allow us to turn towards each other instead of on each other. 
this whole structure has been built on black people seeing each other as enemies and not as resource. And so part of my work, what I talk about in my book, is for us to begin to cultivate that resource in each other and see each other as, as actual people that can help us get through this stuff as opposed to believing what the structure has, has kind of put inside of us and we've kind of metabolized. Greg, listening to Resma, how possible do you think that is? How hopeful are you that there can be real healing in Tulsa? Yeah, I, I am hopeful because I know that there are fighters who continue to be on the front lines and who are undergirded by the spirit of our ancestors. And currently in this time, a hundred years since the massacre, still people survive. I think that getting to truth and justice is what is going to free us though, because when we sit here in Tulsa, we understand that there's been two pathways to black success, black freedom, was met with bombs and burning and murder and looting. Black uh, cowering uh, or, or following uh, coddling of white supremacy has been met with success in many ways. And so I think the answer to this is to once again find success in black freedom and blackness. And I think when that happens, that will free the, the, the multitudes of Tulsans who are still suffering from what happened to us so long ago. Yeah, Brittany, we know that, um, you know, so many of these harms continue to show up. It's not showing up as, as Greg just talked about with bombs and with fires and destruction in that way necessarily, but there's still a lot of uh, trauma in our communities, police violence, uh, redlining, gentrification. You go down the, through the Greenwood district now and there's not a single black owner of a building here. And we know that Tulsa is just one example of that. How do we move forward? Well, first, before I was anything, I was a teacher. And I came to Tulsa in 2014, 2015 to do a workshop for teachers. And I asked one of them to take me to Black Wall Street. And I said, okay, so when, when does this get taught? What year, what grade, what month, what unit? No answer. We're not required to teach it. In fact, I only started teaching it, this teacher is telling me, I only started teaching it because I'm not from here and somebody finally gave me the history and I realized it was my responsibility to pass it on. So we cannot heal what we do not acknowledge and what we do not name. Um, and the fact of the matter is the violence continues in all of the ways that you just described. Poverty is violence, miseducation and undereducation is violence, bad housing is violence, unlivable wages are violence. All of those things are perpetuated, not just in Tulsa, but across our communities in this country and in the broader diaspora. So when we call a thing a thing, we enable ourselves to say, look what we have survived. Think about what we can build. You know, from 1863 to 1923, at least 26 Tulsa-like massacres occurred throughout this country. Why don't we know about these? Why don't we talk about them? They're perfectly content with talking about the past when it's 1776. They're perfectly content when talking about the past in Normandy and the American troops storming the beach to defeat fascism. They're perfectly content in talking about the past whenever it relates to the glories of the United States. Well, we have a version of the past that we wanna talk about. Just as you understand that 1776 is foundational to what happens in 2022, to 2030 beyond because the past is not static. The past is animate, it's alive, it's part of the present. We have a history that is integral to our lives and to us moving forward. And we have to begin with that premise. The other part of it is I think that we have to begin to question the idea of moral culpability in this and the assumption that people share our sense of outrage. Mm. And the reason I say that is this, for all of those dozens of purges and attacks that took place in these communities and people who were marginalized, people who were murdered, people whose property was taken, uh, the people who just showed up and said, by tomorrow we want all the black people gone from the town and we're going to presume ownership of all of your property and this happening again and again and again, if you went to any of those mobs and said the consequence of this 
is that you will gain unprecedented economic value. You will gain the political power and influence. You will marginalize all these people. And a hundred years from now, your descendants will have to express mild remorse, mm -hmm. some hand wringing, have some slightly uncomfortable conversations, but still be in a position to dictate the parameters which, by which these events are memorialized. Yeah. That's a deal people would have taken. And so even as we attempt to begin to memorialize what has happened, mm -hmm. we see the reinscribing of the very dynamic that led to the tragedy in the first place. And until we are willing to grapple with that, we will not be operating on the true terms of our subordination. The reason I ran for mayor against Mayor Bynum, who uh, has a history of enslavement in his family, whose, whose family benefited greatly from the, the trauma induced on my family, is because you build hope from taking that first step. Uh, and I think that I don't want to miss that, like the, the fact that our black kin is coming back to Tulsa from across the country, from across the world and saying, we didn't forget you all. We see you. That's about as powerful a statement that can be made, because think about what happened right after the massacre. There's a massive cover up. And for 100 years, the Mecca that was blackness the achievement that was blackness, the excellence that was blackness in the midst of Jim Crow was covered up. And so by lifting the lid off of that, which we're doing this weekend, and locking arms from Tulsa to Chicago to DC to New York, we don't allow for that lie to be told that blackness can't exist and blackness can't be great. I think that when we talk about reversing that trauma, we've got to start there. It is true that white people who have profited off of our degradation, off of our oppression, they don't have the self-interest, right, to fix that. The only people that have the interest in seeing blackness once again reach its throne is black people. And I think that that is our pathway to freedom. Hopefully some white Tolstons will see this too. The, the right type of body practice, the right type of meditative practice to engage in, to kind of help to open the door, cross that threshold that we know we need to cross to really get to a healing place, a whole place, a redemptive place. Right. So first off, you know, um, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to all of my people talk and, um, and I'm picking up on this sense of resonance, this sense of resource this sense of possibility. When I just listened to, to brother uh, talk, one of the things that, that landed in me is this piece around resistance. When it comes to resistance, the way that trauma gets moved into the body is that trauma over time becomes decontextualized, right? So when something happens to me personally, if time moves past, that thing that happened to me will now look like personality, right? If something happens to my family, it now looks like family traits, right? If something happens to me and happens to my people, it now looks like culture. The only remedy for that is voices to say something happened to my people, something happened to us. So when we continue to talk, what happens is, is that we put context to the thing and the body begins to recognize that as a resource. That's why what we do and what you do is so important. This panel, the preceding panel, the next panel, the voice allows for us to say, I'm not crazy. I'm not defective. Something happened. And in that thing that happened, when I hear another black body and see another black body say something about it, it creates room for other things to emerge. Yeah. So what we do when we're talking about trauma is that we understand that trauma is not just personal. It is historical. It is intergenerational. It is persistent institutional and personal. And it overwhelms us. So when my brother talks and my sister talks and my brother 
talks, what happens is, is that we can pinpoint that one thing and create discernment and then allow us to begin to heal, right? That's why what you're doing is so important because those black folks that for the first time hear this will go, I'm not crazy. Stuff is still happening to people that look like me and we can heal through that. did you first learn about Black Wall Street? After getting out of college and coming back home and uh, getting involved in the community, I had ties with the Greenwood Cultural Center and so it really, really helped me to build a, a, a yearning for diving deeper into the history. So I actually learned about Black Wall Street here at Booker T. My history teacher, her name is Ms. Coleman, she has passed away now, but she was committed to making sure we understood who we were, where we came from. And uh, that was the first time and that was the last time so between then and maybe me returning on a few moments you know, after college, I didn't really hear much about it after then. What do you all think about the, the current commission that's been formed? Um, Jamal, I know you were a part of that commission. Yes. What happened? Uh, there were several things that took place that just didn't align with who I was and what I believed. And one of the things, so to speak, initially, it was the race riot centennial commission. And the, the fact that it was like, pulling teeth to get them to change the one word from riot to massacre um, really showed me what some of them were about and what they, what they truly felt. There were some historians in there who a lot of people leaned towards who really challenged the word of rewriting the history. There were some philanthropic representation in the room who really challenged the rewriting of history. And so it, it really made me see things in a different lens to see that it was not solely about what the community wanted because I was closely tied to the community mm -hmm. and they knew that, which is why they asked me to be the project manager. And so I would hear from the community and the community would say, hey, we need to get this name changed. And so I went in saying, hey, let's change the name because this is what the community is saying we need to do. And there were some young people who I had placed on the commission who were like, yeah, let's do it. If we're gonna do it, it needs to be done now. We can rewrite history. But then there were also some of our elders, um, white and black, so to speak, who just simply said, yeah, uh, it's been this for this long. We need to just leave it there and leave it alone. And so. Uh, that was one of the things. Greg, what has your experience been with the commission? Well, what Jamal talked about, I'm going to talk about from a little different perspective. There are people like myself, people like Representative uh, Regina Goodwin, people like uh, City Councilwoman Vanessa Hall Harper, who uh, may have been invited to participate in the commission, but because we didn't agree with their stances, we declined. And I think that that says a lot about the lack of support that they have from the community from the very start. It's not a lack of support in commemorating our people and commemorating our history, but it's a total lack of support in doing it the wrong way. And it was just very clear from the outset that the commission was a commission in name only in terms of honoring the race massacre survivors and our ancestors and people like myself just, just were not gonna be a part of it. I was engaged by some people on the commission to help with the commemoration and the disbursement of funds and how that would go on an entertainment level. And when I engaged Vanessa and some of the Greenwood Chamber of Commerce and different people, and when I go in and ask questions about accountability, who gets to decide where these funds go? Who gets to decide who makes a decision about uh, what's a worthy enough cause to be supported during this time? You know, Who are the voices and the people that are in the room? It's very clear that they don't want uh, us who have power, they, they have a few people who are there for the sake of representation, but are not holistically representing us. And so when those questions of accountability came and it's like, hey, you have two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars to do what? And there have been no reparations given. Well, what's happening? And it was at that moment, literally like on, in the middle of a call, it was like, yeah, we probably would just have somebody else take it from here. And so I think the reality is like the majority of the community we don't feel like that's our, that's not our commission. Mm. That's not our community. Those Whose are not our is people. It? It's Tulsa's commission. It's What's that thing, Greg? <laughs> it's a conservative white Republican commission. Just okay. like. But so who is Senator Kevin Matthews in this commission? Well, Senator Kevin Matthews did commission the start of this, but Senator Kevin Matthews, like a lot of black people, finds himself in a position where he can either compromise and do what the white power structure says, or he can risk the status that he has. He made the decision to compromise. Certainly those are those of us who wouldn't do that. 
particularly with our history. So those commissions have two different purposes. The 2001 commission was led by leaders like Representative Don Ross and Senator Maxine Horner, historians like Eddie Fay Gase and John Ho Franklin. They had one purpose, to find the truth, to tell the truth, and then to provide recommendations on how to repair the harm. The 2016 commission, now the Centennial Commission, they stated from the very beginning that this was about bringing attention to this issue so that they could create cultural tourism in the area. And those are two very, very different purposes. I don't understand uh, how you can move on to tourism before you've dealt with truth and justice, uh, except if your goal is to further profit off of the massacre. We're sitting here at a white-owned establishment in the heart of Greenwood during the centennial. I just wonder from you, knowing that there's no black-owned buildings in the Greenwood district, how does that make you feel? It just, I mean, it's tragic. Yeah. It's just as tragic as going 100 years without finding the bodies of people killed 100 years ago. Are you a descendant? Uh, yes, so I'm a distant descendant, yes. When did you first learn about Black Wall Street? It's almost embarrassing. I'm 61 years old right now. I was in my early 30s and I grew up here in Tulsa. It wasn't taught in school. Uh, it was Tulsa's dirty secret. Yeah. It's a dirty secret that has um, been told to some descendants, but not as many others. And to that end, um, I know as a state senator, you introduced Senate Bill 17 which of course stands up the commission for the Tulsa race massacre. What was the impetus for that? Why was that important for you to do that? Well, actually, there was a special election for me to be, have the opportunity to be elected in 2015. I'm in the legislature at that time, I was the only black man in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And so I formed a coalition of elected officials, many of them white, many of them Republicans, and just said, how could we create something that would be able to bring funds. And on the way, we saw the National African American Museum of History and Culture was telling this story in a major way. Five million people went there in the first two years and I thought, we need to do it in a big way. A coalition of people asked the mayor and others to give five million to the Cultural Center. So you mean the Cultural Center, you're talking about Greenwood The cultural Greenwood Center. Cultural Center. Who owns that building? Uh, I, I'm not sure who owns the building. Yeah. I know that the city of Tulsa has the land that they lease to the entities. Yeah. And so then we came up with the big idea to build something to tell that story in a major way. And that's how we went from there to raising now 20 to $30 million to build the history center that you see now. It was totally focused on how we could tell the story, how? which is the first part of what needs to happen. How important is it to you that all of the resources raised through the commission be designated specifically for the museum and the commission events that are being held this weekend? It's extremely important. That's what the law said. Mm -hmm. And so it's extremely important that those resources are uh, coming here for uh, telling that story and, mm -hmm. and supporting uh, the black history that we're talking about here. Have you been in contact with the survivors, the three remaining survivors, about their own stories? I personally have not. Have you they, spoken to them throughout the whole five years that the commission has been established? When the five years that the commission has been established, as far as I know, mm -hmm. um, this past year, Dr. Olivia Hooker was the last known survivor that I'd ever even heard of, and she passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know uh, of survivors but one. I hadn't met with him. Uh, we had actually even given him an award uh, probably early 2015, 2016, right here on Greenwood. Was it a monetary award? No, there was some, some, some type of uh, uh, acknowledgement. I, so, so. Well, let me ask you this. You said you were only aware of two. Are you aware of the three remaining survivors? We have Mother Randall, Mother Fletcher, and Uncle Red. Are you familiar with the three of them? I've heard of them this year since we've been in the legislature. I think there had been a lawsuit had been filed mm -hmm. and then I heard of those individuals. We were told that they'd been reaching out to the commission um, formally at least since November. 
um, to connect and to have a meeting to ensure that they were able to shape what is actually goes in the museum and have an opportunity to tell their stories, to be engaged with the centennial events. And you're not aware of any of that outreach? I'm aware definitely that of a lawsuit filed. Our oh, name I, is listed yeah, in there. Yeah, before the lawsuit, just the outreach to the commission. Because you're the chair of the commission, correct? I'm the chair of the commission, yes. And you're not aware of any outreach from the survivors to talk about sharing their stories, to be a part of a board, ensuring that their basic needs are taken care of, because you're, I'm sure you're also aware they're living in poverty. Okay. I am aware mm -hmm. of a lawsuit that was filed that we were named in. So but, you're not, you don't have any, you didn't have any contact with them other than the lawsuit that you saw filed. Mother Fletcher, Mother Randall, and Uncle Red. There is one person mm -hmm. that had been working with the survivor. Okay. Working with, I think they had started to renovate the home, et cetera, that reached out to me and talked to me about it. When was that? That was the day that we were... Um, breaking ground on this. When uh, was that? It may have been around, I'm, I'm assuming around yeah. um, December, December of uh, 2020. So when you think about um, these remaining survivors who they're all who are left that we're that we know of, what do you think they want? Well, I think they want justice. I think they want uh, their lives repaired. I think they want uh, what all of us want for them. Mm -hmm. Well, when you say us, what do you, what do you want I, for them? I want for what we offered. I want them to have financial compensation. I want their health care taken care of for the rest of their lives. I want them to have reparations from the government, from the city, the state, and the federal government. I think that uh, they're owed all of that. So but the even city, the, state, just let me ask for a clarification. The city, state, and federal government, do you mean cash payments? Yes, I mean everything yeah. that, uh, now I'm not, sophisticated enough to know what all the reparations should be. Mm -hmm. But I think we should have those conversations and everything that they want should be on the table. I think that there have been issues raised around Tulsa 1921, who's culpable, who's liable for that. And then there's a continued harm argument about the commission, that the commission has not engaged descendants adequately, has not engaged, engaged survivors, has raised money off the image, likeness, and the names of survivors, but haven't, haven't given them any money. So I think there are two separate harms being discussed. Our funders have even offered cash payments. How much did the funders offer? Uh, $100,000 to each of them and a $2 million seed gift to start a fund for continuous money. $100,000 per, per survivor basically gives them $1,000 per year since the Tulsa massacre. Do you think that's sufficient? No, I don't think it's sufficient. I don't think that, I think that the number should be tremendously higher, but I think it should be from the government. I think it was a-, a What about the companies that are also culpable? There's, there are banks that have purchased other banks in Oklahoma, the insurance companies that refuse to process claims because of a riot clause. Are they also liable for- I think so, but yeah. I don't know that my commission has that. Oh, I'm not putting it on the commission. No, I think that yes, mm -hmm. yes, I, there's definitely, I think that the government, the businesses that have benefited are all liable, yes. What about the businesses, for example, that contributed um, as sponsors to the commission? Did, have you had any conversations with them about the culpability and the liability, the responsibility they have for restorative and reparative payments to the survivors? Let me just be clear. Okay. What my thought process is about this mm -hmm. was I started this and raised this money to build this building. After May 31st, we will have built this building. At that time, I want to go deep into reparations that's happening on the, the conversation is happening on the congressional level. I want it to happen on the local level. I think that the problem is that we're trying to put the two together. I why think do that, you think that is? Why do I think what When is? you say that we're trying to put the two together, why do you think that is? I think that I'm 61 years old. 2001, a report came out yeah. that Representative Don Ross and Senator Maxine Horn right. put out. From then till I was elected in the Senate, nobody did anything. I don't know there was, why. Well, there was a lawsuit filed by Charles Ogletree, Johnny Cochran, um, Demario Solomon Simmons was still in law school at the time, who was a part of that lawsuit. Um, they were told that they had no standing for that lawsuit. There have been actions taken on behalf of Tulsa and in Tulsa for years. Whether or not it's been considered or even moved upon, I think it's the mentality of 
folks like Mayor JT Bynum that stand in the way of these things. Um, so I don't think it's fair to say nothing has been done. What I'm saying is nobody moved the ball and offered any amount of money until now. See, there's, there's uh, two mindsets. Uh, one is how much is enough? Yeah. And the other one is how much can be done? I care about the enough part. Yeah. And so I would lead or be part of just that conversation because I think it's very important. So can you understand why people might be a little frustrated with seeing a $30 million building and not having any restorative justice or economic empowerment themselves, not owning any of the buildings here on Black Wall Street where we used to own all of them? Yes, I can see that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's easy to see. When we got to these serious discussions about the significance of changing the mission of what we were doing, this, we, this, a ton of this money had been spent. How much money is still unspent? I would imagine. Um, I, You're the chair I, I would of the commission. Guessing. You have access to these reports. How much? Well, is I can I can look it up for you. Then. Yeah. Would you consider um, introducing a bill supporting reparations for Tulsans for survivors and descendants? With no hesitation, yes. The commission recently announced it was canceling its largest event um, after John Legend and Stacey Abrams said they were no longer going to participate. Why? It is my assumption because that you're the chair i am the chair mm -hmm. and i'm the chair that's in session in oklahoma city while a team here is working on all of this work mm -hmm. i think i'm safe to assume that uh they want what we all want is something to happen for these survivors mm -hmm. and i can't tell you that's why i can't tell you why because they didn't talk to me are the survivors participating in any of the commission events this weekend? Uh, the demands, there were seven demands submitted to um, the commission. After several months of asking for time with the commission, the commission for the first time agreed to meet with the, the representatives of the survivors when there was a threat that John Legend and Stacey Abrams may not participate. So the first meeting was called on Saturday, the second was Tuesday. The demands are as follows, $1 million per survivor. You agree or disagree with that idea? Regardless of who pays it, $1 million per survivor. I think that the survivors, if it's 10, 15, 20 million, still would not I'll be take enough. Take that as a yes. Yes. What about two? This is a $50 million pledge, which is different than cash payment right now, pledge to our survivor and descendant fund. Do you agree or disagree with that? Okay, this is what I, this is what I, I pledge. Yeah. I pledge that we start a fund that everybody could participate in, and I pledge that I want the government to pay reparations. Did you tell the mayor that? Uh, I've said it publicly. Did I've you said say it to, it to everyone. The mayor? I will say it to the mayor. Very good. The mayor, yes. What about the governor? The, and I've said it to, yes, I've said it to the, what about to the governor. Senator Langford? I've said it to Senator Langford directly, yes. That's good. I want you to post it. Okay, here's number three. <laughs> okay. A lot, 33% <laughs> of Greenwood rising revenue to directly benefit survivors and descendants and the North Tulsa community. The commission's work is over. I won't be on the commission. Nobody will be. We, That's this, not, this doesn't say that. Okay, I, so I can't commit the new board to do anything with their revenues that I won't so be part of. So this is probably a no. So number four is Greenwood Rising Board Makeup. They want six board seats for people who are supported by and directly related to descendants or survivors. I think that a lot of the things that they say are reasonable, okay. but I don't think that I can be the one I'm, to I'm determine I'm just asking you if you agree or disagree with these things. You all know? I agree that there are a lot of reasonable things mm -hmm that are being requested, that are necessary and needed. I think okay. that many so of I'm them are Okay, so I'm gonna take that as a yes. <laughs> really quick, next thing, public supported the lawsuit for reparations, which you said throughout this interview you I support, support. I support reparations. Would you publicly support the lawsuit? Which lawsuit? The lawsuit that you I referenced before I did. I would not support a lawsuit that I'm in. Okay, but and publicly one support that, lawsuit for reparations so the survivors can be made whole from Greenwood. I believe that, that they should be whole. Yes. Okay, so then I'm gonna take that as a public support of the lawsuit. The next is a public apology from you. No. Why? Because I told the truth. I did not lie. What did you say? Senator I Matthews? said that uh, what was not spoken about in Congress was that people that are, are the key people that are funding us are willing to and already in negotiations for 
paying cash payments to the survivors. And you wouldn't apologize to the survivors for what was a perceived attack on their character? I, I would apologize to the survivors. So, I would, I would, so I would, would do probably, anything for the survivors. Okay, so you would, the survivors. That's fine. That's but this was supposed to be, I took it as a public apology for making the statement that I made. About the survivors. Which was what? They, they, when you talked about what was said in Congress, who testified in Congress? The survivors testified in Congress. All three survivors. So they wanted a public apology for the survivors. You would be willing to do that? No. I would meet with the survivors and anything that they felt like I had done that hurt their would feelings. You stand, would you stand with them publicly and apologize to them publicly, the three survivors? For saying that they, that, that for we were... For any would... perceived slight of the survivors based on their testimony before Congress. Based on their testimony. I did not. I'm going to take this as a note. Here's the last one. Okay. For, well, the last one is off. The last one was the Rise and Remember event. They wanted to help shape the program, but the program was canceled. So I think we're about halfway there. I think you should make the call, Mr. Chairman. I should make what call? We know that in addition to this money they raised, they're building a museum. They're commemorating events all weekend. Have they talked to you all about, you know, giving you any money, anything from the money they've raised? Not a word. Mother Randall, what do you think is taking so long in Tulsa, in the state of Oklahoma, for you all to get the reparations you deserve, for descendants to get the reparations they deserve? This has gone on too long, too long. So I know everybody's tired, I know I am. But, but God knows, he only knows. So I, I just gonna leave that up to him. <laughs> state of Black Tulsa reminds us that this community's fight for restorative justice and reparations is a long winding road. To walk us through what this fight has looked like, I spent time with attorney Demario Solomon Simmons, advocate and lead counsel for the three remaining massacre survivors and executive director to the Justice for Greenwood Foundation. I also spoke to descendant Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, the founder of the Demanding a Just Tulsa Coalition. So tell me what you were saying about this. Black Lives Matter. So they had planted Black Lives Matter down on Greenwood, right in front of the buildings. Yeah. And the city came through and said it was illegal graffiti. And then they were like, they were going to have to remove it. And then as their cover, they decided to put in a new road, a new paved street over, something that they've been needing to do for, you know, a long time. But they decided we'll go ahead and do it now. Yeah. And it was like this big deal with a the city council, the mayor's involved. It's the only place in America that we know of where the, a city pulled up yeah, Black Lives Black Matter. Matter on Greenwood. So speaking of Greenwood, when did you first learn about Black Wall Street? You know what's funny? I went to I went to school right there mm -hmm. at Carver Middle School, which as you see is on Greenwood. Yeah. But I didn't learn about Greenwood, Black Wall Street until my junior year at the University of Oklahoma. And I was sitting in the class with who became a real good mentor of mine, Dr. Kepper Nuwakion, rest in peace. He was in class talking about Greenwood and all this. And I, and I was kind of intimidated to say something, but I raised my hand and was like, yo, I'm from Tulsa, that's not true. I ain't never heard that. What? And he gave, he, he, he lit it to me, gave me all the smoke. And ever since that day, I've been obsessed with learning as much as I could. And then as you know, yeah. from the time you met me, educating others and then advocating for it. Yeah. So um, you know, that, that's, that's how it happened. People didn't talk about it. Why do you think that is? Well, one, for black folks, fear. We can't even really imagine to have a full 40 blocks decimated over a 18 to 24 hour period. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? This was like a sustained campaign, state sanctioned, authorized and armed. Yeah. 
One of the things that I think is so important for us to unpack a little bit is the re-traumatization of Black people. It wasn't just Tulsa in the Greenwood District of Black Wall Street. There were a number of things that the government has done and repeatedly done to continue the harms. One of them, as you just talked about, with trying to take up Black Lives Matter. Not trying, doing it. Well, doing it, but <laughs> marking it as graffiti. Right, as graffiti, yes. Yeah. You know, that's interesting because we talk about uh, 100 years of continuing harm, yeah. which we call as, as violence through policy. Yeah. And so right after the massacre, I mean, days after the massacre, the city passed a ordinance to make it more difficult to rebuild. Our people who had already lost everything, money, businesses, lives, had to use whatever resources they had to actually fight that yeah. illegal, uh, unconstitutional ordinance. Two years later, they built the largest KKK, what they call a Clavern, meeting hall in the nation at the time, right next to Greenwood. So people had to just see it every day and be traumatized for the, through the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, up through the 50s. Parts of Greenwood that was able to rebuild didn't have paved streets, didn't have indoor plumbing. This was all a ploy and policy because they wanted to run the people out of, out of Tulsa. Yeah. They wanted their land. When that didn't work, what did they do? They turned to urban renewal and they received, again, policy violence, federal dollars to come in and just tell you the whole place is blighted, steal all the land, yeah. push all of us further north where I grew up. And the final nail is the highway that they intentionally, yep. specifically, the yes. purposely yeah. put right through the heart of the Greenwood Business District. Yeah. And that was it. At that point, they moved everybody out north. They created a ghetto. Since I met you while we were both in law school, you were the reparations chair, <laughs> staying on message, right, exactly. um, you know, for the National Black Law Students Association. I'm curious to understand from you, for folks who don't understand what Justice for Greenwood Foundation is all about, why you stood that up, you know, what the challenges you've experienced are in trying to just get justice for the survivors. Well, yes, the foundation, just for Greenwood Foundation, was set up for four main points. Number one is we seek financial compensation for those who suffered through the massacre. And financial compensation, obviously, from those who perpetrated the harm, yeah. but also those who have been benefited from the harm, yeah. right? And so they also have a responsibility to pay and to help the survivors and those who, who've suffered. Secondly, we want to make sure that we hold the perpetrators accountable. Yeah. To this day, no one has been held accountable. Uh, and obviously most of the individuals were probably deceased, but the institutions and the entities are still alive and doing very well like the city of Tulsa. The commission, of course, just announced that it canceled its biggest event. Two people with major national platforms, Stacey Abrams, John Legend, pulled out of the event. They said, right. if you're not gonna do right by the survivors, right. we don't wanna participate. Right. That was real power. Yeah. That was real power. And that's what we need. We need real power that we can exercise and not be afraid of it. You know, we stood toe to toe with the commission and said, look, if you don't do these seven things and do right by our community, make sure resources come back to our people. We won't participate. That's all we said. Yeah. We won't participate. And then with John and Stacy backing us up with that, that's how we get things done. Well, we have Tiffany Crutcher here, Dr. Tiffany Crutcher. Y'all plan this. You got your purple on. Y'all serious. For the attorney. So we were just talking about the commission, which, as you know, canceled its biggest event. Yeah, I always tell people that, that Greenwood, 10,000 people were displaced during the massacre yeah. because of racial terror violence. And they didn't leave Tulsa because they wanted to, because they were immigrants. They left as refugees and they went to Chicago, they went to Kansas City, they went to Los Angeles. And so Black Wall Street is everywhere. Right. And so on this 100 year anniversary, we're calling it the homecoming. Everybody is coming home, back home to this sacred land. And so it is on all of us all over this nation because Black Wall Street is a spirit, it's a mindset. Right. We have Black Wall Streets everywhere or we should be trying to reimagine what Black Wall Street could be in our own communities. And so it's just not our fight. Tulsa is simply the microcosm of what's happening all across this country. And if we can get it right here, we can get it right everywhere. And so I'm just grateful for the national voices, the people who have platforms that can echo our voices right here uh, in a city that hasn't done black people right. 
Uh, they've left the, the, the community of North Tulsa behind. But on the south side of the tracks, you see high rises, you see rooftops, you see condos, you see restaurants, you see banks. Over here, we have nothing but, but trees. They just planted a tree right over here in honor of the massacre. What are we gonna do with a tree? Right. And now they're telling us to pull ourselves up and that, oh, it's just about money for them. And so I'm baffled by um, the, the notion that, okay, yeah, we'll give the survivors a few pennies, but we don't want their descendants to inherit anything. And so it baffles me when, when they robbed us of our generational wealth, but they don't want descendants to inherit anything. They robbed us of everything that we owned, even our spirits. But guess what, we're resilient, we're here, we feel empowered this weekend. We've stood strong because of the support of people like you. Why is it that we have to acquiesce and go along to get along because they may give our foundations $100,000? Why is it? So we said no more. You have to go, but I want you to answer me in one word. What does justice look like? Reparations. Well, I heard you, sir. <laughs> Come on, reparations chair. Signing up. You got to go. I'll check in with you okay, later. Okay, sounds good. Tiffany. So I think um, the one piece that we haven't really talked about, and I want to connect the dots for folks, is you're the twin sister of Terrence Crutcher. You, you know, you run the Terrence Crutcher Foundation. Why is it so important to connect the dots of what happened in Black Wall Street, the violence against Black bodies? and the continuation of that harm all over the country too. Right, well, you know, it hit me like a ton of bricks when uh, we started talking about commemorating. Yeah. Terrence was killed not too far from, from here in this black community. And that's in fact what brought you back home. That's what brought me back home. Terrence was a third generation descendant of, of a survivor, my twin brother. And I always say, Angela, that the same state sanctioned violence that burnt down my grandmother's community, the same police department that deputized white civilians and Klansmen, is the same police department today that killed Terrence with his hands in the air, unarmed. Uh, he wasn't committing a crime. He wasn't under arrest. He didn't do anything. They, they killed him. And I've drawn so many stark parallels. You know, I often wonder what my grandmother was thinking when she had to flee. From, from mobs of white folks. Terrence, the same thing, just walking with his hands in the air slowly and a mob of white police officers fled to the scene like he was the New York bomber. Yeah. When you consider your legacy, the legacy of your family that is so rich, also so painful, what do you hope your legacy will be? I always say that I can't bring Terrence back, who was murdered at the hands of state-sanctioned violence in Tulsa but the last words he spoke to me on our 40th birthday, 30 days before he was killed, he said, God is gonna get the glory out of my life and I'm gonna make you proud. So I have to make sure that I fulfill his prophecy and fight like hell to make sure that Terrence Jr., who is the spitting image of Terrence, doesn't have his same fate. That's the legacy I wanna see. I, I, I imagine what Tulsa could be like for little Terrence. I too have a dream like Martin Luther King, that one day we won't live in a food desert here in Tulsa, that one day Terrence will be able to, to, to walk outside free and not be concerned with the police pulling him over. I too dream that, that, that one day he won't be discriminated against when he goes to buy a house or goes to get a loan. That's the dream that I have for, for my legacy and my nieces and nephews. And, and so I'm gonna fulfill Terrence's prophecy and I believe that this weekend and the words that he spoke and the fact that you're here and everybody is here echoing our rally cry is living proof of, of that prophecy. I love that sis, I know he's proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Oh, love you. You're trying to make me cry. <laughs> Just a couple of weeks ago, you all went to Washington, D.C. Was that your first time being in Washington, D.C.? In, in D. Washington, in my first time, yes. yes. And you all went to testify. You and your brother, Uncle Red, Mother Randall, you testified um, on the computer, but I saw all of your testimony. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. What was it like to testify before Congress? Well, it was wonderful, and we hope it, it was a 
a help for us to, you know, go through with all of that traveling and time consuming and everything to say those words. And a pleasure for them to allow me to say that, <laughs> to be, you know, to represent them. Yeah. Yeah. Mother Randall, what was it like for you to be able to testify before Congress? Well, I just told it like I saw it, like it happened. It wasn't a pleasant sight. It really wasn't. And I, I thought we should be able to overcome all of it. But there have been some good changes. One of them is we had a, the, our first black president, and now we have our first black vice president. Yes, indeed, and woman. You all got to meet her while you were, you were in D.C. Talk about that experience. Well, it's, it's just a big experience for me to, you know, to live long enough to see that. Yes. So that, that I think it's wonderful, and I think she's doing a good job. And it's time that we should have, you know, someone like that. So so far, we've I've seen the president and the vice president. I love so that. I've been pleased from that. That's yes, sir. Uncle Red, what about you? How was meeting Kamala Harris? It was a pleasure to let the world know. Speak to a vice president. It was a pleasure and an honor, and just I just let let the world know what's what's yeah. going on. Uncle Red, Mother Fletcher talked about how sad it was for you all to depart, and as you talked about, you were a baby at the time. But I know you know that airplanes were dropping bombs on the area, but you still went and served in the military. Was it a hard decision for you to make to serve your country after your country seemingly betrayed you? Yes, uh, it was hard. We had uh, a segregated army. It was a black army and a white army. We had a white captain. We had two black lieutenants. When I got out of the army, the most that I paid, they give you so much money. And I had think, I, I get. I think I got about ninety-three dollars. Ninety-three dollars? Yes. Uh, I understand. Looking at history, it, it, it was supposed to be more than that. Yeah. See, when I left to go to service, I had a wife and a three-month-old child. You go. You go to the mailbox. Look at the mailbox. It said report for study duty. Yeah. To such place. So you were drafted. Yes. I was just only 21 years old. So let me ask you this, Uncle Red. I saw, I talked about the Red Cross report from 1921. Okay. In this report, there's field order number four. In field order number four, it says, all the able-bodied Negro men remaining in detention camp at fairgrounds and other places in the city of Tulsa will be required to render such service and perform such labor as is required by the military commission and the Red Cross in making the prom proper sanitary provisions for the care of the refugees. Right. The refugees were your friends, some of them your family members. Right. They were drafted too, so yes. to speak, on June 2nd, 1921. So the day after some of the people who were incarcerated, some of the people who were seeking help, they made the black people come serve, but not the white folks. That's right. And you got drafted again. Yes. This old bear Arla, you was court martial, which it, it was put you in prison. Ooh. Yes. So you faced two injustices. Yes. Literally fleeing your home. There are people who um, weren't babies yet, but they talk about the number of stillborns mothers had at that time of the massacre. People who would have been your contemporaries, you made it out alive and they didn't. Yes. Yeah. Just, just lucky I made it out alive. Just uh, shit, you know. So much of the remaining injustices and frankly, the all out assault on black economic power in Tulsa can only be addressed through the policy making process. Policy changes can always be influenced through the power of the people. We need to see some major shifts on the federal, state and local levels. Joining me to discuss now how we do this are Congresswoman Maxine Waters, State Representative Regina Goodwin, Tulsa City Councilor Vanessa Hall Harper, and last but certainly not least, Rashad Robinson, President of Color of Change, who knows firsthand just how powerful we can be in influencing policy through petitions. 
Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We've started um, almost every conversation in Tulsa over the past few days with what does justice look like in one word? So I want to just go down a line and ask you all and we'll just jump in. So Congresswoman, what does justice look like in this situation? Well, uh, one of the reasons I was so interested in being here with you today, uh, because you made it clear, this is about reparations. And so this has been a subject that's been banded around for a long time, been talked about, been alluded to. Uh, and now I do think we're at the point where real decisions are going to be made, uh, how we move forward and what we're gonna do on reparations. As you know, the Congress of the United States have taken it up. Uh, the Judiciary Committee led by Ms. Jackson Lee, Sheila Jackson Lee and others, our allies, are moving forward and giving real leadership. And so the discussion, uh, not only because of what's happening on the Judiciary Committee, but George Floyd. And that murder uh, has helped people to understand what was going on. Some people who maybe didn't really believe us or didn't really realize how bad it was. And so now it is time for us to talk about what is this country going to do to compensate people of color, black people in particular, for what has happened to us in our past and the way that we have been robbed of uh, wealth and the way that we've been discriminated against and the way that we have been murdered. So reparations is what it's all about now. Yeah. One word would be reparations. I agree, but we gotta be very clear what we're talking about when we say reparations. So in my mind, reparations is land and cash, period. Everything else is good policy, land and cash. Slavery reparations or reparations for massacres, land and cash. Rashad. Well, I wanna associate myself with the comments about reparations. And then I just wanna to add to that, justice is also about the path forward. And it is about changing the rules for the road ahead. Because as much as we have to restore, we have to understand that if we keep the same rules in place, more harm will continue to take place. So let's contextualize this uh, reparations ask or demand of land and cash with what's happening in the state. We know the Oklahoma governor recently signed legislation that would make it more difficult to teach critical race theory in the classroom. Any student that is uncomfortable with the subject on race, a teacher could be penalized. So if we're just talking about educating people about Black Wall Street, what can really be done with the governor you have and frankly, the mayor, right? The mayor is, is saying that uh, nothing, there's no uh, liability for the city because folks were not acting under the color of law, which is of course a federal standard, um, when, when they were a part of the massacre. And so therefore there's no um, cause of action. So what is the path forward really at the local and state level here if you're getting that kind of objection from the mayor and the governor? If you don't mind. Yes, please. Um, that's such a loaded question and I think a fairly simple answer. The bottom line is this, um, it was a stupid bill, 1775. Yes. Uh, I, enough with the nice words and, and, and all right. It made no sense. We had black clergy that tried to meet with the governor to say, why would you do this? And it is a fact that Representative Don Ross, right, Senator Maxine Horner, yeah. some 20 years ago, a 200 page report was done and reparations were recommended. That's a matter of historic fact. And I wanted to put that in a resolution to acknowledge this time 100 years later. And the supermajority Republicans said they were not going to hear that resolution, wanted it to be a joint resolution. And when we talk about documenting who we are as Oklahoma, I said that makes Oklahoma at least look like you tried to do something 20 years ago. You didn't do anything about it, but at least you gave thought to it, right? They came up with their own resolution in their own words, and it was not befitting of the time or of the lives that were lost or the generations that are here now that may go forward. Uh, so when you talk about 1775, it's not only in the classroom, they don't want it happening at the Capitol for us to acknowledge history. And I think it's shameful that Oklahoma has this kind of leadership right now. And uh, you know, we had to fight to get it passed. And the only reason they passed it on the last day of session is because when they said to me, we're not going to do this, I said, then choose ye this day who you're gonna serve. But if you don't do it, we're gonna be national about it. And that is the only reason they allowed it to be passed, because they didn't want that national light, right? So they hurried it off the floor, 
We did it very ceremoniously, and we're gonna keep pressing on. Counselor, I wanna ask you at the local level, in addition to the very clear opposition that you have with the mayor, what else are you experiencing as you all try to move ordinances along or get the type of recognition that we know Black Wall Street deserves? The experience when we're talking about the black community on any issue is always resistance. It's always an automatic no. And the reason for that is quite frankly racism. It's racism and it's white fragility. And what we have to do is continue to do is, is, is just fight to push the line to, to if, if they don't, as uh, Representative Regina Goodwin just said, if they don't do it, then we're going to put you on blast. And so this is an opportunity for us in Tulsa that we can't let these opportunities pass us by. The eyes of the world are, are on Tulsa, Oklahoma right now. And so we have to use that and take advantage of this opportunity to let the world know what's going on. Yeah. Rashad, I did not realize that you all began this petition process in 2019. Of course, the existing commission that's raised $30 million off of the massacre has been in place since 2016 when Senator Matthews introduced uh, the legislation at the state level. Why did you all get involved and how important is it for people at home to engage on this issue when they're saying, what does Tulsa have to do with me? Well, like a lot of issues, we get involved because people invite us in. Yeah. They say, you know, we need some help. We need um, people to engage in what we every single day try to do is channel outrage energy um, into strategic change. How do we get people to focus energy? And the work around reparations um, has been um, work that we've done at Color of Change for years. And, and reparations both in terms of supporting legislation federally, um, the you know, HR 40, um, reparations at the local level, but also as we engage in uh, holding corporations accountable um, doing it with a reparations sort of state of mind, right? Not just asking for charity, but structural change. Not just asking the companies to apologize, but actually asking them to make amends in really clear ways that are measurable. Um, not simply asking them to give us write-offs that you know they can walk away, but actually making sure that the changes are things that they can feel and that the community can feel. So for us, this sits inside of that larger work. Um, you know, our, our advocacy has been in deep partnership with folks at the local level, and we are really proud of that. And we're also proud that as part of this work, that we're, you know, being able to tell this story to a whole new generation of people. Um, through this work, uh, 7.2 million uh, Black folks and allies of every race, 6.2 on our SMS platform, um, folks on our social media are hearing about these stories and are able to then share the content, engage on social media. And for us, that's incredibly important as well, because we have to build the type of awareness that allows us um, to be able to move people quickly to the type of action, the type of demands that are going to be necessary to produce real change. Congresswoman Waters, when did you first learn about Black Wall Street? I'm not sure when it was, but I think it was uh, prior to getting elected to the California State Legislature. I was basically an organizer out working with, you know, um, Head Start parents and all of that, uh, that I was becoming more and more aware of what was going on, not only in our country, but internationally. But I didn't really get involved in it until I was in the United States Congress uh, with Mr. Ogletree, Attorney Ogletree, who was such a wonderful man who had passion about this issue. And he engaged me and others. I came here and I was involved in a town hall meeting and I was a little bit surprised. There was not the kind of support for uh, reparations or anything substantial. I think they were talking about statues. And I left here thinking, we can do better than this. Uh, but I want you to know Mr. Ogletree, Attorney Ogletree, was involved in trying to uh, get rid of the limitations on being able to file lawsuits. Yeah. And so this picture that I brought with me today is a picture of us in front of the Supreme Court yeah. with survivors that you all know fighting for justice, for the people of Greenwood and Tulsa. And so, you know, I'm really more woke now than I've ever been because, you know, God bless, I've been able to become the chair Amen. of the Financial Services Committee of Congress. Yeah. And yeah. it's dawning on me, I should have had the banks and the insurance companies yeah, in talking. here a long time ago. And so I've instructed my staff there uh, that they are to get started uh, with us doing what we have to do in order to engage the private sector 
uh, because I'm gonna clap for that too. Me too. I'm gonna clap I'm for that too. I'm getting the audience right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want you to know uh, that when Jamie Dimon and all of the big CEOs come before us, we gonna we gonna bring them back in. When I sat down with Uncle Red just the other day, I said, "What's the thing that's standing in our way of progress?" And yeah. he said, "We have to vote." Yes. We have to vote, and it's so crazy. It always comes back down to that lowest common denominator, but whether you're talking about the mayor here mm -hmm. or the governor, the power is in that crossing that first threshold into yeah. exercising mm -hmm. our franchise. Yeah. So we've got to do that. I wish we had like another hour, <laughs> but thank you all so much for doing this today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having so me. Much. Love you. In order for Black Wall Street to not be limited to a physical location, Black Wall Street must become a mentality, a way of being that permeates our culture. That means new sources of income, new tools, renewed minds, and the discipline to organize Black economic power, not just around consumption, but around ownership. Black Wall Street is also about innovative economic solutions. Our calls to action most often focus on much needed policy changes, but we also need innovative economic solutions. Joining me now are Natalie Cofield, an assistant administrator at the Small Business Administration, Kevin Matthews II, author of Burning to Blueprint, Rebuilding Black Wall Street After a Century of Turmoil, Angel Rich, founder of Credit Rich, author of History of the Black Dollar, and Tyrance Billingsley II, founder of Black Tech Street. Thank you all so much for being here. So we spent a lot of time over the last several days with folks talking about the history of Black Wall Street, but not enough, I don't think anyway, on the mindset, the mentality, the resilience, the tenacity, the self-determination that was really needed to open its doors to begin with. What do you all think we need to do in this generation to ensure that Black Wall Street really becomes a mindset? I'll start with you, Natalie. Um, so first off, Angela, thank you for having me. Um, as you mentioned, I'm with the U.S. Small Business Administration, and one of the biggest priorities we have is around ensuring that minority communities and black businesses recover from the COVID pandemic. And so much of this is about the innovation that we have continued to endure time over time. And this example of the Tulsa massacre is just but another example of the ways in which we have continued to evolve. And so the Biden-Harris administration is committed to infusing capital, to infusing programs, to infusing supports, and to infusing the resources that our community needs to come back from this pandemic and to come back from future circumstances that we may experience. And I think part of this also is about, and just personally speaking, always making sure that we have examples of black entrepreneurship front and center for everyone to see. Thank you, Natalie. Um, Kevin, I wanna come to you. Natalie talked about a pandemic. That's not the first pandemic black folks have experienced, right? I think that this, is, this was a, a tremendous one, the massacre at Black Wall Street. When you think about what's happening now in the Greenwood District, super gentrified, not a single building owned by a black person, what has to happen to make Black Wall Street black again? And will that be just confined to a geographical location? I think the one thing we have to do is is to, to think about that shift, because a lot of times we think about one location and real estate being the only asset class. That's not necessarily necessarily the case. Uh, for example, in 2008, when the housing crisis hit, black wealth dropped 50 percent, whereas white wealth only dropped 17 percent, primarily because we were not investing in the stock market. Cryptocurrencies were not a place that we were investing. So I think we do have to make that shift because also in the stock market, in the crypto market, it's left much less discriminatory. For example, black homes are devalued at 48,000 dollars per home. If we all buy the same stock at the same time, we're all getting the exact same price. So let, let me let me just turn to you for a second and, and, and switch gears a little bit, Angel. How have you personally adopted a Black Wall Street mentality? What do you do to ensure that you, every new venture you take on, right, has that a little bit of that mentality associated with? And what do you say to folks who are trying to figure out how to embrace and walk in that same mentality? Yeah, so I actually take this very personal uh, my great grandparents were some of the original black homeowners in the country. I come from the DC Black Wall Street. Uh, my great grandparents came from a, pretty much what used to be a plantation in Lancaster, South Carolina, was able to work their way up and 
owned a home in Capitol Hill, which my family still has to this day. And growing up, my great grandmother, she always emphasized that we spent money within the black community, that we spent it within our actual geographic community, and that we understood the importance of the black dollar. And a lot of that has gotten lost um, over time. And I really think that it boils down to that community mindset, that collective shared dollar is what we really need to get back to. Surely we will rebuild Black Wall Street. I want to come to you, Tyrants. What is the most important takeaway from Black Wall Street pre-1921, before the massacre? What's the most important takeaway for folks to have? So the most important takeaway is that, well, it's a couple of things. One, that economies can and should work for everybody. And for two, Black Wall Street was a four minute mile. Black people can do anything in this country against the worst odds. That's what Black Wall Street represented. And that's what it should represent to everybody who thinks about it. The phrase that I've come to learn to use when it comes to describing Black Wall Street is to tell young black kids, your blood is noble. That's what you come from. That's who you are. If we can build that in the midst of Jim Crow, in the midst of having the lack of resources, and in the midst of a world when it's okay for people to kill you and you will have no recourse, what could we do if we had the resources behind us that everybody else did? This world would benefit in a way that hasn't been seen. So it's not charity work. And the message to the rest of the world is, imagine what could happen if you were to stop oppressing everyone. You know, our powering partners, Second Muse, always have a phrase that says, racism is the glass ceiling. For all of human history, only a small number of, of, of people's innovations have pushed the world forward, whether it be feudal lords, kings, or whatever, because you're oppressing people via race, uh, gender, or all of these other, all these other structures and things we create to make some people worth more than others. Imagine what a world looks like where everybody's creative capability is able to contribute to pushing society forward. So I, I want to ask you all, um, from your vantage point, from your experiences, if you would call the massacre terrorism, would you say it was terrorism? Was it an act of terrorism? What happened on May 31st and June 1st, 1921? I think it was. We have certain people in the United States, different organizations. So, yes. In the, the Red Cross report, it also talks about where were the police? Where, were, where was the, the government? And you all from experience, um, and for also from all the research been done, know that they were also involved. Yes. Right, they allowed for this to happen. <laughs> Have you all um, received, and, and Uncle Red, I'll start with you. Has the city of Tulsa ever taken responsibility for or paid for the damage done? No. Mother Randall, I'll ask you, has the state of Oklahoma ever taken responsibility or paid for what's been done? No, no, not that I know of. And then Mother Fletcher, I'll ask you, has the United States ever taken responsibility or provided justice for you all after what's been done? This is enough, my knowledge, they haven't. Yeah. You know, but I think they should. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen um, restorative and reparative actions taken for 9-11 survivors for Japanese internment um, and uh, some other displacements, some other massacres, including Rosewood um, in history, but never for Tulsa. And so I think what we know, just like with Black Wall Street before, where you had to take rebuilding into your own hands, even with a commission commemorating your own history, once again, we're having to take matters into our own hands. So there's the Justice for Greenwood Foundation that we're directing people to utilize, to raise money for you all so that you all don't have to live poor. We want to see you all living well, and that is our commitment to you going forward. You got me, Uncle Red, since those tears on Capitol Hill, you got me. I'm right here. So on that, I wanna hear from you all. We talked about what justice looks like. What do you want your legacy to be after all of this? What do you want your legacy to be for young Tulsa coming up now? I would say, I, I've talked to the young folks out today, and I want to hear them. First, strive and ask questions and keep going ahead with the education. We are one, one. 
we want to be treated like one. I love that. Thank you, Uncle Red. Mother Randall, when you think about your legacy for this area and for young people coming up, what do you want that to be? We, sometimes I think we're making progress, and again, what is progress? <laughs> so just about what he said, I think it's the spot where it is. Mother Fletcher. I haven't had a very small income all of my life, and I certainly would, you know, appreciate a little help to myself. Well, I can tell you all, you've been so courageous, and you've inspired so much and so many, not just when you testified on Capitol Hill, but it certainly made a difference. And I think you all's fight um, inspires so many others who are pursuing justice, whether it's in police violence or it's in pursuing reparations that they know they deserve in their communities. So I do want to thank you all for all you've done. Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate, sure appreciate getting that invited into this. Yes. I often tell my brother, I said, well, they're wondering where did they find that little old lady. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that you all are here, and I'm glad we are one, <laughs> right? Black Tulsans all agree on these three things. We must educate the world on what happened here, get economic justice for Black Tulsa, and most immediately obtain justice for the survivors, Mother Randall, Mother Fletcher, and Uncle Red. But when we consider all of Tulsa, the state of Oklahoma, and the nation, this question remains. If there's no path forward without justice, why hasn't the collective focus in Tulsa been placed on ensuring the survivors are actually lifted from the jaws of poverty so they can finally enjoy the lives they once lived before this tragic massacre? Triumph can't happen without intention, and it definitely cannot happen without a commitment to radical truth. Today we heard that truth from the survivors, descendants, activists, healers, and national voices who are engaged in this fight every single day. While there's more work to be done, recent victories demonstrate the impact we have when we come together around a common goal. We must be reminded that on the road to triumph, we have to embrace this power that is uniquely ours. Uncle Red asked that we not let him die without seeing justice. We have a collective obligation to answer that call by making the demands clear at every level of government with corporations that are responsible and requiring more from each other. Triumph must define us more than tragedy. The spirit of Black Wall Street lives on. Welcome to Greenwood.